Thank you for checking out the second episode of the What is Cycling podcast. Today we have Domino Ireland with us, and the only way I can think of how to describe Domino is a pirate and a cowboy. So you'll understand in a second. He's an avid adventurer, a former Marine. He's hiked the entire Appalachian Trail and biked the whole Route 66. He's created his own treasure hunts, AKA a pirate, and they have been found, and created one of the wildest bike races in the country with Manduro. So welcome Domino, and first off I wanna ask, did I miss anything in your intro? Of course you did, but you know, we'll, we'll <laughs> save that for another podcast, how's that? But no, oh, that was there excellent, you thank you. Thank you for having me on this, this is excellent. Perfect, thank you. And so, obviously, you're very into adventure. The idea behind Manduro, which we'll get into here in a little bit, is adventure. And all of your accomplishments are based around adventure. So how did you realize that you had the adventure bug? Mm. I thought about this question a long time. Um, many, many years ago, I started thinking, like, I think it all has to go back as I grew up in Oklahoma. And, you know, when I tell people, I say I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But really, I grew up on the other side of the river in this little town called Jinx. Jinx America, and most of the people that go to the school in Jinx, you know, they have some money, but the people that live on, lived on my side didn't, and, and I grew up in a mobile home, uh, you know, we had to always be creative with our, you know, with the things that we did, and, and um, you know, I had plenty of space to go explore and do all those kind of things, so I think that kind of got me into thinking, you know, there's got to be a little bit more to this world than, you know, this little area that I'm at right now and so it just gradually expanded out and expanded out and expanded out and I think that's probably one of the reasons why I went to the Marine Corps uh, right out of high school was you know sort of for that that adventure you know side of it yeah I completely understand because I every day at my work I always daydream and I just think about adventure like whether that be van lifing or doing the Great Divide or the Appalachian Trail or whatever I always find myself going back to those adventures and like doing Manduro and stuff like that style of riding and adventure just really gets me amped and going. That's good. Cool. You got, you got it. I, I've seen you ride. I, I've seen you, I've seen you out in the middle of nowhere riding and I, I know you, you're kind of, a, <laughs> you know, lone wolf adventure as well as, you know, a good team player adventure with uh, some of the guys that you like to ride with. So yeah, that's cool. Which foreshadowing is not the right plan for Manduro, but true. That's true. <laughs> However, <laughs> I mean, as it's been seen, like it's, it's, I think maybe, yeah, that's, that was a surprise with it. And I'm sure we're going to get into this, but mo everybody that's been successful has figured out a way to kind of team up with somebody else that pushes them, not hinders them. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've found that kind of fascinating because I didn't think that would be the case. I'm so used to, you know, anything you do, you know, you're a you're as slow as the slowest person in your group right whether you're going sightseeing at disney or you know you know you're trying to figure out which restaurant their bar to go to next you know whoever's l l lingering behind is the slow person and such well that applies over really to racing as well and for something that's not built as a team sport as uh, these races are um i think that it's you know it's surprising that it kind of evolved to where uh i've had People say they would not have been successful if they hadn't just out there found somebody riding at about the same speed that they were that actually helped them. Um, and I think that's completely different than a race where you and another person sign up together, you know, separately in this case, but you sign up together with the intent of riding together. It seems like most of these situations have been where you just discover somebody out there that's maybe a little better than you or that, that pushes you and um and you, you go with it you know um i think i tried to approach i try to approach all my programming in that way where sure you can do it with other you can do them with other people you can do the treasure hunt with other people and all that stuff but ultimately it comes down to you know you and and you know how you know how you how you take it on so to speak absolutely if you go into that i that race with the idea of like okay i'm signing up individually but i'm going to do it with someone you definitely both have to be on the same page because if not someone's going to blow up and i mean with manduro nothing ever goes your way <laughs> like you say there's going to be some point in time in the race when you're going to want to quit and you're going to want a different bike yeah so <laughs> let's let's just give the listeners what is manduro explain it to them 
Uh, so the, the big race is a 250 mile uh, race that in the past had to be completed in 36 hours. That's changed to 30 hours now this year. Um, everybody that's ever done it has done it in less than 30 hours. So um, I mean, out of 90 attempts in the four years, uh, there's only been 13 people, 13 completions. So um, that's not, and that some of those are the same person that's completed it um, multiple times. Uh, and, and a smaller race, Mindoro, is a 60 mile race that you have to do in six hours, and um, only one person has completed that one uh, since it came about. And then we have a winter version of that, which uh, seven people have completed the winter version of that. A little bit easier in the winter. Well, it depends on the, the uh, obviously the <laughs> the conditions outside. But you know, the first year it was you know in in late December and it was excellent conditions for that particular one. And so you're not battling the heat and stuff. The other two races happen in August, and you know, I mean, the heat is brutal. It's just it's just even when it's you know rained and stuff, it's still. Yeah, I can definitely attest to that. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So, so it's a, it's a, the race is uh, basically an adventure based race where you don't know, you only know the next place you're going, um, based on QR code. So you'll scan a QR code at the beginning. It interacts with Google Maps, uh, and then there's a dot on your map. You start riding towards it, um, and at that at those locations, there can there can either be another QR code as a tag on a tree or a bridge or you know some other object, or there can be a uh, task stop where you've got to do some kind of you know, 30 second to, you know, minute and a half task. Um, and then, or it could be a, an adult beverage stop or someplace that's, you know, tempting like a brewery or, you know, winery or a cidery or a restaurant, you know. And that's the thing is, you know, not giving in to temptations and keeping moving. That's the most important thing. And so those are, those are built in to both, I don't know, make it fun and break it up so you never know what's right around the next corner but also to mentally um, challenge folks. And I think, I think one of the biggest challenges is you can't, people that can't just look at a map and be like, all right, here, where are we going? You know, you're so used to doing that in other races, whether they be bike races or running races. You're so used to be able to like look at a map and like, you know, look at the topographic profile and all these different things and strategize. Yeah, like check the wind's blowing like, this way, so I'm going to take it on this turn. You can't turn. do that yeah. in this race, and it's never the same. And people underestimate uh, this region of, of the country. And, I mean, the ups and downs come quick. You're not in the mountains in Asheville, but you're certainly not out at the beach. You know, you're not, um, you know, you're not out doing a gravel ride, and, you know, in a, you know, flat state park or something sitting there. It's, it's definitely. And I think the breweries, too, going back to that point of, like, you put stops at breweries because it's, like, it seems like it's the Navy SEAL training bell of like, okay, it's just right there. All you have to mm-hmm. do is ring it. So it's like, oh, there's a brewery. I just have to make it there, and then we'll see what's going to happen right after right. that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we, we, we held it during 2020 during COVID and stuff because, you know, essentially you're you're about as far away from somebody else as you can be, and we planned out um, those type of checkpoints accordingly. And with that, you know, those breweries that have been our sponsors for years, they, like, just they donated stuff. So we were able to actually make it a little bit more adventurous because – you weren't going to physical uh, venues and things like that. You could be out in the middle of the woods, and there is a, a stop um, that's manned by you know our chain gang volunteers, and you know, and then we we made it where at those places that's where you would do a task, you know, and the tasks vary accordingly. So they're all they're all just fun whimsical things, but they also like kind of break up the monotony and and take your mind off of the suffer fest that you were in, in, involved with at the time. <laughs> and so how does the conversation go? Because I've always been intrigued by this. How does the conversation go when you're like, Hey sponsor, would you like to host the ax throwing challenge? Are they just like, let's freaking do it. Or what's, what's that conversation look well, like? Lucky for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lucky for me, uh, my circles of, friendships and, and acquaintances and stuff extend out into that brewery zone and um, almost all of the breweries in the area um, before starting this you know I knew somebody whether it be the owners or the investors or some or I was an investor myself or I've come to know those folks you know throughout the years just just chatting them up because they'll you know those guys talk and they're like 
you know, I'll get an email from somebody and say, can we, you know, is there any way you can loop us in on the course or, you know, that kind of thing. But for the most part, you know, some of the, the crazier ones, I mean, there's not been anything super crazy, but like chopping wood, for example, that was in one, uh, I think in 2019. And at Bond yeah, Brothers. Bond Brothers. That was so one of the ones the, that I the did. listeners out there, yeah. Bond Brothers is a brewery in Cary, North Carolina. And, um, those two guys, the Bond Brothers, are really good friends of mine. Well, right next to the Bond Brothers, there's this uh, wood-fired pizza place, right? And they chop all their own wood. So, ding, 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 I get this thought in my head. Well, could you get it? How about we provide some of the chopping for you? Now, granted, I think that year there was only like 22 people in it, but I, it, they have been on the course before where no finisher, nobody even made it that far. And so they were prepared for us. So Bond oh, Brothers wow. on the okay. course at a late on the on the Saturday on the a later stage, right? And so you know when I went to them, I said like hey, I'm going to put you on the early stage, so you're guaranteed to get every rider. Like if somebody drops out before they get to you, some free somebody labor gets to you. So they just <laughs> you know they set it up, set our, our volunteers out there, and so that was a pretty easy one to do. Like some each one of them you know takes some logistical uh, doing on my end. Um, some of them are easier than others, but um, you know for the most part. I just kind of think about it as, as a fun, you know, fun thing to do. And, you know, a lot of work goes into some of them that people don't even like really realize. Uh, one year, were you in the year that you did Bartitsu? So that's when you guys should look up Bartitsu and it's not what you think it is. It's gentleman cane fighting, <laughs> uh, sort of that English gentleman style cane fighting. And one of our, uh, one of our. Oh, I was there for that one. Well, yeah. You had to dress up with umbrellas and so, so canes our, and stuff. Yeah, one of our uh, chain gang volunteers, he's a you know he's a fourth degree black belt, and he, you know, he's very calm and he's a pretty good he's a good instructor and that kind of stuff. So I'm like, hey, you know, could you do a little thirty second, you know, step by step thing here? And you know, gave him some tweed and you know just what you want to put on in the middle of summer, you know, tweed coat and tweed hat, and <laughs> twirl cane. But uh, I did a survey last year and that was named like one of their most people's memorable and favorite thing that they ever did out there. I mean, all right, that's cool. Yeah, that was, that was very memorable. So what is like the inspiration behind Manduro? What gave you that idea to be like, I'm going to go do an adventure race where you don't know the next place you're going until you get to the QR code. Yeah. Um, that's a really great question. Uh, a couple of guys here that, that ride bikes, they're pretty crazy guys. They uh, they go out and do all these crazy rides and such. And they years ago, they were out. They said, you know what? We need to have this ride where we, you know, we ride ride around, chop some wood, and we ride somewhere else, and we uh, do some paper mache or whatever, and, and then we ride somewhere else and have, have a beer or whatever. And, and so, you know, they told me about this, and, and I kind of, started thinking about programming it out and such. And, um, you know, I thought, well, if you're going to do that, you know, it should be an adventure an extreme. And I think, you know, QR codes that have already had already come around and gone and gone a little bit. And I think since 2020, I kind of came back. I was into them a little bit before the pandemic brought them back in full swing. Um, and I thought, well, you know, if we had these QR codes and they, you know, told them where to go, then you, you, you don't have to have people physically out there, uh, you know, pointing people to another, another place. And they have to start the ride with no concept of what's going to happen around the next, you know, around the next turn or over the next hill. And so, um, and to me, that's real adventure is when, you know, you have a plan, but you kind of take a little detour. And that's when you're like, those are the memories that come back all the time. You're like, man, you know, I, I didn't expect that. And that's probably some of the best feedback I've ever gotten on this is writers like say, how did you find this trail? I've been here all my life. I've never seen that trail. Or how did you think to go there or whatnot? So, and so, um, you know, just I kind of just put it all together and package it all up. And then I, uh, when I started my company in 2016, I was looking for events that I had in my in my repertoire that I had never done and some that I had you know done some before. And, I, I went ahead and, you know, asked the guys. I had them out at this famous little uh, restaurant slash bar here, PRs, in Raleigh, and said, hey, what do you guys think if I go ahead and, you know, make this a reality and program it out? So they were cool with it. And uh, 
fact, the guy that conceptualized it, but really the first person I ever heard say the the race, you know, premise was the first person ever out of the race and the first person to ever break a bone in the no race. No way. So, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, four the hours first year? In. Yep, 2018, four hours in, went down on a bridge, which tried to catch oh, himself, goodness. broke his hand. So. Wow. And, like, mm-hmm. I thought you might have gotten some inspiration from, like, the Barkley Marathon and stuff like that, like rip a page out of the book and keep it with you because – Along the race, you do have to take QR codes, but also, like, there are certain pieces along the race that you have to keep with you, and then once you get to the finish, you have to show that you've been to all these stops by providing, one year it was the book pages, another year it was, you had to go and trace, like, certain stuff, and there's just a bunch of different key elements that really makes this race a raging adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for saying that. Yeah, so the, the the Barclays they do use book pages, and you know I saw, um, you know I saw how Laz did, you know did it Ziplocs, you know tucked in a thing, and and you know right off the bat I thought well I'm gonna I I got I got I went and bought thirteen of, of those Pelican boxes, the the small ones, so that they could be like secured out in the middle of nowhere, and I can put whatever I want in that. And so the first year I did use book I think I've used books twice, book pages twice. Um, the first year is because I actually had a bunch of books left over. It wasn't necessarily because Laz does that over there at Barclays, but because I had a bunch of books left over from this kind of mobile escape room that I used to do for team building. And so I'd set <laughs> another, this little another thing of domino. Yeah. <laughs> I'd set up this library thing, you know, so, you know, you're, you're looking at all the elements and books are a, a cool thing to have there. So I had all these books. So I've used stickers um, this last year, oh, and rubbing. So during the, the pandemic, I just wanted it, people to get in and be able to get to them and get away quick. So did use raised letters where you had something in a crayon where you just did a rubbing there. Uh, of you know, there's a different word at, at, at the different sections. Um, uh, this last winter one, I you had uh, different hole punches. So there were in, in Mindoro, the smaller race. There are seven checkpoints that are like that in Mandaro there are 13 you know I tried to come up with something different every time the, the one we're gonna the, the races we're gonna do this summer in August on August 12th and 13th they're gonna be you know I've I've got a really cool start that'll be different than anything we've ever done oh man I can't wait to hear about it but yes. so from your freshman year of Mandaro how has it changed because I've heard the first year it sounded like it was extremely hard to find the QR codes. And then it seemed like it got easier as the years have progressed or like it's been more manageable and not as time consuming. So how has it, how has Mandura transformed over time? Yeah. I mean, all of that is, all that is true, including the transformation. And some of it is on, on me and my staff and how we uh, approach it. And, and some of it was on the riders. So the very first year, you know, I could tell people, look, you've got to keep moving. You can't stop for any second. Or here's what the QR codes look like. But if it's the first time you've ever seen a box, or if you don't have the concept, even if I've told you the concept is, they're in no particular order. It could be, you know, could, you could be 12 QR codes on, attached to trees, and then there's a box with a QR code. And, and, and then... 12 more than a brewery or it could be Fox Brewery QR code. I mean, it could be any order. I don't think most of them got a little bit uh, lagged down that first year in the first, you know, in the first six hours. <laughs> Number one, it rained for the first eight hours. Like it oh, deluged that's for the first eight hours. Like we had people in the first year in August drop out of the race for hypothermia. So, oh wow, uh, you know, so, so you know, it was pretty much a, a deluge in there, and you know, imagine if you're slowed up. But I think they did just didn't have, you know, the the concept of, you know, what you're looking for at each each spot. And so, like the first time they ever went to a spot that, uh, that it was like I put the QR code at eye level, like they were all in the woods all around that stuff instead of just going straight to the spot. And, and, and then, you know, I, I, at that year, the very first year, I included in a task as part of 
getting from point A to point B. So at that area, the, it got you to a spot, you know, a compass that was embedded in a in a greenway, and asked you to shoot an azimuth into a direction where there's trees, a creek bed, and all that stuff into rolling hills, and go 500 feet that way to find the QR code. Wow, and that sounds extremely difficult. <laughs> And so, but I told all the riders, like, learn how to shoot an azimuth and all that kind of stuff. And it took, you know, it took a bunch of riders, like, not even knowing how to do that stuff. It took somebody to show up that was a rider that did adventure races that was used to using compasses and shooting an azimuth. So after that race was over, I, I decided, like, look, let's, I'm not going to do anything like that again. It, I don't want the objective is for you to, like, test yourself, not spend all this time trying to find these QR codes. I want you to find exactly the spot. There's nothing tricky anymore. So after that year, there was absolutely nothing tricky because we screw ourselves up. Like, we think we can go one way and we're in a neighborhood and there's, you know, dogs there, the path we thought we were going to go, and you got to backtrack or you're, you know, you think you can just go up and cut down this road and you ride past a greenway you should have got off on and end up on the wrong side of a creek or something. Like, we screw ourselves up. I don't need to trick anybody because you guys trick yourselves. And so definitely. Um, yeah. And so I just, you know, and then it became a little bit more real when, you know, the second year when you're actually looking at people um, making mistakes that cost them minutes and sometimes the race, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Some of the things that people do that, especially like first time riders, for example, I think in 2020, you know, I had some excellent elite riders come in from you know, other parts of the state, the country, they're out there and they, they did not make it. And one reason was, you know, they're 80 miles into the ride on day one. And, you know, we, and we track everybody. I, I should tell your listeners this. So it's evolved to that where the, you know, you don't actually need like some of the apps and things to track people. Google does it for you. So if you turn on Google location for us, we can track your dot in almost real time. And no place around here really has any place that's out of you know, satellite or tower connection. So it's pretty accurate um, to at least know who's on the course and where that we're about there at and, and that kind of stuff. And so, and also Domino is kind of you, they give you permission to track them. You're not just tracking them outside yeah, part of <laughs> without you, them knowing. Yeah. Now, it's, when you sign up, it's part of the you realize you have to you have to turn on tra tracking to be in this race. So they sign up for that and they they agree, which is a, a huge benefit on their part because you know if their dots sitting in the same place for thirty minutes or an hour or something like that, I know something's wrong. We're watching it, you know, at either uh, at headquarters or we if, if you know when COVID's not around, we did it at you know at the you know at the sponsors place. You know, we put a big screen up and. It's a spectator sport, you know, when you can't even be out there. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, even though you need to be self-supported, you need to be able to get extracted and all those kind of things and stuff, we're not going to leave you out there to die. <laughs> you know, we're not going to leave you out there. If you're hurt, we're going to make sure you get in. And I can see when you – I don't know if everybody knows, but if you have Gmail and you go to your maps, if you're signed in, you go to your maps and you put on location sharing and you turn it on, and you always it defaults to one hour. So you have to turn it on until you turn it off for that default. Um, some writers have made that mistake before, but I think I I've made see, that mistake. <laughs> we, we we can all see every, everybody that you've you've allowed us. We can see how much time you have on how much uh, you have on your phone. So if you're like getting down like thirteen percent of energy on your phone and those kind of things, we can see it. And you know, there's been cases where somebody's spouse was tracking them. You know. Like, look, you need to switch to battery right now. Like texting them, calling you on your last bit. You need to, you know, switch to to batteries. And so there's nothing like just scanning that QR code and then it's just hitting something. And then you just got to decide, you know, which way you go. Yeah, for and all you future mistake, riders out there, definitely take external backup batteries with you. And I can attest to that just trying to keep my phone alive because continually pulling your phone out and looking at where you're going, it drains the battery pretty well too so it's uh yeah, yeah definitely take some external batteries with you and so yeah, you got to get yeah you got to get all that stuff dialed in for sure guys will you know they'll duct tape them to their you know their top tubes and you know, there's been people that have you know had like dyno hubs or things like that to fuel their 
their phones and I, I mean there's been all kinds of stuff but it, you know none of that helps if you don't just take like a few seconds and realize how google like you can't shortcut this you have to think so most people will and it works most of the time will allow google to show the route that they should go to from like you're here pull it up there's dots out there somewhere they'll allow google to show them the route and i've told people for years listen just take an extra couple of seconds and hit each one of those routes that are on there so it'll show you the way you would go if you were walking the way you'd go if you were riding the way you would go if you're on a bicycle um, go ahead and turn on the layer in your google maps that shows all the bike routes in green on there and you just you'd be surprised how many people have are out, out of the race because they didn't change it over to satellite view versus the default view and they thought the they thought the qr code was you know on the other side of a of a lake, the next checkpoint was on the side of a, of a lake or a, or of a stream or whatever, because they're just looking at a blue line on a against a gray or <laughs> green. That was Enduro. Instead of instead of like turning on and realizing, oh, Google's got it wrong where that creek is, and so they end up on the other side, and you know it's thirty minutes around. So, I've fallen victim to that in Menduro when we all had to cross the the river, or in Mandaro when I think I probably went like three or four miles out of the way. Instead of, I, I could have just gone down this kind of dirt gravel road that went over this lake and I went all the way around. Mm. And then I saw other guys coming down the actual gravel route. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. I could have saved so much time had I just done that. Yep. Yeah, just a few extra seconds looking at your maps and decide. And then, like you were saying, if, if you're listening to that, you're like if some people will have it mic'd up and they're just listening to where it tells them turn by turn or whatnot, I just eat your battery up. I would just pick a spot out there that you kind of know. I'm like, all right, it looks like that's about five miles. Like, not the spot. And I'm going to have to turn and then just shut everything down and, and ride in that general direction and then, then check back in. <laughs> How has the gear changed? Because I know, like, talking to a few people who did the first year, I'd know that they – I mean, no one really knew what to expect or knows what to expect on any race in the initial year. But I know, like, some people brought hammocks and they're like, oh, we're going to – try to get some shut eye and all that stuff. But how have you seen that the gear has changed? Well, don't expect to sleep. I mean, there are guys <laughs> that have went fast enough that they could have taken a 30 minute cat nap and still finished in relatively right around the time that they, they did or whatnot. But you know, just be prepared to be up for Mander, be prepared to be, be prepared to be up all night long and all day and, and, and push through that circadian rhythm cycle as you, as the sun comes up and catches fourth wind and keep riding uh gear on these bike races so especially on manduro i think people just have altered their setup but you know during this 2018 like the whole gravel bike culture has really come in and and the perspective has changed so gravel bikes can handle you know can handle you know a lot more especially if you start you know to going tubeless or you know wider tire setups and that kind of stuff if you're willing to hike a bike you know and to have a lighter bike you know in times when it really gets you know rough out there then you know that's a good setup for most people you know we set our first single speeder and i think he realized uh he's one of the best single speeders around and he at 70 miles at 70 miles, this guy was, you know, 30 minutes ahead of everybody. 20 miles later, they caught him and passed him. So, and it wasn't until he found somebody that was in that group that had the potential of finishing and he locked up with them and, and, and they helped each other along through the night and the next day that, you know, got him through it. So, it, he is a beast. Like, he could easily ride for, you know, 30 36 hours it's just a matter of can you do all the other stuff keep you know keep your phone going keep your body going yes you can keep your bike you know you have a double blowout or you go out of all your tubes or whatever you're out of the race you know like if you didn't carry all that stuff you can't get somebody to give you that stuff you're out of the race so it's it's, it's interesting but i what i think more importantly is is the thing that took people out in 2020 more than anything was after mile 80 they a bunch of these guys like great riders they stop and we watch them they stop at a chipotle 
You see, you see their dogs <laughs> all go to a Chipotle. Now, all of those folks missed Get those carbs. No, it was about there's about six of those people that missed the one a.m. cutoff by about the amount of time they wasted going to that Chipotle. Ooh, so, that hurts. Up and out, right? Um, I just remember with 2020 is that it was so hot. And if you don't know anything about North Carolina, Raleigh is one of the most hot and humid places in North Carolina. And so it's the the triangle and like Durham and all that stuff. So I remember for 2020, I was trained up. I was ready for it. I knew what the strategy would be for the front group of like, we're going to go, we're going to go fast and we're going to try to bum rush the first three or four hours to kind of get some distance. And then we're going to slow down the pace. But with doing so, the few, like my body stopped digesting solid foods. And so I just couldn't recover from that. So I remember hearing from people, they were like, we saw your dot moving. And then you just stopped on this hill. And I was like, yeah, I was puking on the other side of a guardrail. I was like, <laughs> and then it's one of those moments when, you know, like when you get sick and you're like, okay, well, I feel better afterwards. I just, I never started feeling better. So I was like, I think I did two or three more stops. There was one stop that was in the middle of like a single track trail a mountain biking trail and i was delusional i was like i was so dehydrated i was i didn't have any like food or fuel and i was just like holy crap and luckily i found a water spigot and i just laid under it and turned on the water but after that i think i made it maybe one more stop and i was like all right i gotta throw in the towel because i was Yeah, it was brutal. It's 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 from our perspective, like when we're watching this go down in real time, it's heart wrenching. You know, I know, I see you guys train, and you know the the folks that are around here, the locals that do it, and you know it is like you know I want every I want I would love everybody that starts it toes the line to be battling it out, like to get to that last thing. Of course, you don't know it's if it's the last one unless it starts and ends at the same place, and you already know that, and we've already told you that, then. You know, at some point you're going to scan a QR code and it's like, oh, that's where we started. And you, then it's like, you got to get after it. But you've, you, the unknowing of whether it's, I mean, obviously if you've been to box, Amanda, or if you've been to box 13, you know, wh- whatever QR code you scan on the inside of that box lid could take you to another spot. But I think most of the time it's been straight back. It may be one other place or, or it's been to the finish line, wherever that is. It's different than the start. Um, and so... You know, you kind of know when you hit box 13, there's not that much more. Of course, you can tell where you are via, like, where you're at in the, you know, in, in the triangle area. Um, but, you know, that unknowing thing will really get people just out of it. So if you had everybody get there and scan it, and, like, the first guy just, like, jumped on his bike and just got after it, that would be my dream. And then somebody run them down. Like, the first winter Mendoza was – was awesome because the first two guys that came in, I could see, we could see it in real time. I knew they were getting that seventh box. I see the other guys dot on there and we're all kind of watching, but it was during, uh, it was during COVID. So, you know, we, I had the thing out on the, the computer out on the hood of the car. We're watching and like, Oh, somebody's actually going to complete this thing. And, you know, then you see the guy cross the freaking Creek, the second place guy to try to get back like to buy some time. The other guy didn't cross the creek. He was riding, you know, which ends up being about a mile and a half around. And they, they had seen each other. So he knows he's close to the other guy. Oh, wow. That's close. And he still finished five minutes behind the other guy. But like he would have been about 10 back if he hadn't crossed that creek. But he gets back. Wow. It's winter. It's, it's hypothermic. <laughs> he didn't get to hang out. Yeah, crossing long. a creek in the winter. That's crazy. Yeah. Dedication. So, but, he, you know, he went for it. Um, and same creek that you guys crossed in – the regular Menduro going the opposite direction a couple of years before where, you know, there, I had a photo, a photographer on that at the other side of that. And so I could really see in real time what really, when there's a pack of eight guys and you're all just standing around pointing and then like, and then what, the, the guy that's leading it, he was, you know, a hundred yards up the Creek, just crossing it. Right. And the second, uh, the second guy that was leading it, he's riding, he's already decided he's riding all the way around to get to that box. And those two get at it virtually at the same time. And the pack of people are sitting there at the, on the edge, like discussing it. And it throws them like 10, 15 minutes behind because I mean, if you're going to cross it anyway, as soon as you see it, 
you shouldn't even ask. Just it. go like, for it. Yeah. You should freaking just go. Like, I, this is it, man. I'm, I'm on my own. But when yeah, definitely. Right, that was, was one of the- that was a fun race, especially like having to hike a bike across a river. That was pretty crazy. Mm. But I think great state stationary cha- train on that particular race where you had to decide whether you leave your bike on one side of this train car, all these train cars that are stationary to get to the, you know, there's a, a checkpoint on the other side. You knew it was there. And some people fed their bikes all the way through, went on. Some people left their bikes. Uh, I knows? always took my bike with me. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to keep it because there might just be some brush that we can go over and then just keep going or what, but it would, it would sometimes bite you. Yep. That's a smart move. That is the smart move. Always keep your bike with you. For all you guys that think you might want to try this someday, like just keep the bike with you or <laughs> close, keep it close. And so I think, I think Manduro, it's like, it's one of the few races where finishing is an accomplishment by itself regardless. Mm. But I mean, the first place winner gets something like some sort of trophy, but I feel like if you win Manduro, bragging rights is enough. Like you don't need, <laughs> you don't need a WWE belt. You don't need anything else just to say I finished and I won. I rode over 260 miles, got X amount of boxes, did so many challenges, yeah. cut wood, pole danced, held a puppy, whatever. I yeah. did it. I think that that is totally, totally enough. That's true. That's true. And uh, you just mentioned the different, some of the different things that you could do or you might do on there. Uh, that's the, the, the beauty of it. The, the longer you, you can just go out and just say, let's just see how you can sign up for the race and just think, let's just see how long I want to ride. And you know, do I have nine hours in me? Do I have 15 hours in me? And the longer you ride, the more experiences, like the more things that we've already planned for you that are out there, they're, they're out there. They're going to be out there for everyone or for one person or for no one. They're all out there. They're all fun, interesting. And all you got to do is keep on going. And we've kind of touched on a bunch of different pieces that like bits and pieces of advice for people. But so what other advice do you have for individuals who are thinking about attempting Manduro or Manduro? Well, the, the good news is this year, you know, I'm not so sure how many years I got left doing this, this particular race. And I kind of want to just, you know, be doing other people's races and exploring the world. And, you know, if you, if you commit to a certain time of the year, what you have to in order to um, to make something like solid and, 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 and permanent in sort of that event realm. Um, I kind of want to do other people's races, but this you know, this year, maybe next year, I mean, I don't know how many more. I have some other ideas, so until I start running out of ideas, um, <laughs> you're going to be into something. But this year's a special year, so the, the interesting thing about this year is that Manduro, you sign up for the race, you're in both races. They both start on Friday at noon. It's just that if you make it to the 60-mile mark, and I'm not going to give you any more about that, but it's out there, and you do it in the first six hours, you have completed Mendura. I don't think anybody's going to do it, but there are some already some people that are capable of doing it signed up, so I'm not going to say they can't. <laughs> so you can race for that Mendura thing, or you could just – Pace it out, stay at the 10 mile an hour, you know, stay the 10, 12, 14 mile an hour zone and, and, and just casually get in and can keep continue on for Manduro and go as far as you want to go and stuff. So that's the different thing this year. We've lowered the amount of time for uh, Manduro to 30 hours. And the reason why is because there are riders that have done it before that, uh, that are out there that can easily ride 250 not easily but they can they can ride for 36 hours like they can do it and they can cover a lot more than 250 miles in that amount of time in one go and what you what they don't want to do is create a situation where riders know they have all of that time and so and they know they're capable but they just they just kind of wallflower it and, and lollygag along and then i've got to have volunteers in stations for you know epic amount of times like six eight hours you don't see anybody for six to eight hours and you're a volunteer in a, in a race it's pretty tough like you know, yeah it's demoralizing we, we, yeah <laughs> i'm not charging these guys enough to pay these people to be able to do that stuff like i don't even break even on these races these are just sort of a uh, you know a 
testament of adventure and like my way of giving back sort of that to, to, the, to the universe, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, that's, um, <laughs> you ask some of the writers that they'd be like, yeah, I'll universe you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I saw on Instagram after one of the female finishers finished last year, she was saying that maybe it's time for a name change with Manduro. Is there any thoughts as to maybe changing the name? And where did the name Manduro come from? I think it was those, you know, the guys was like, oh, this, it's kind of like, you know, the, the challenges you would do for Manly or like there could be, you know, you are tying a, a rose or, you know, you are braiding some hair or something like that. It's kind of both in jest and with, you know, oh, you think you're so manly. But, you know, the, the name man is in human, you know, that that's in there. So. I think she was saying that also in jest a little bit, but a little bit serious because, you know, uh, obviously this day and age, you know, you don't want to, whether you be, whether it be either sex or non-binary or anything like that, there you shouldn't ever have anything that discriminates. And that's not what this race is. So that's just a name. And, you know, early on, like I couldn't believe people, and it wasn't that many people that people had an issue with it. And I start looking at some of the other name th- things out there and I'm like, wow, you had an issue with this, but there's some of these other things that are a little <laughs> bit double entendre out there. So, um, no, we're not going to change the name. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be long gone of the race before any of that kind of stuff. So if somebody wants to buy the race off of me, <laughs> Hey, you want to buy this race? probably be giving it up here in a few years uh you can do whatever you there want you but it, that, i mean <laughs> you know that i think it all revolves sort of around that the tasks not necessarily like can you complete the 250 mile race you gotta remember these guys didn't think of 250 miles they just wanted to ride around and do some stuff and they were calling it mandura right i'm the one that said i want it to be this epic challenge that folks you know have to be you know all in and, and set to do and it be this adventure and it you know for some people it could be the adventure of a lifetime for some people it's just another one of those things that they want to check off their i did it list um but so you know as an outsider looking in i could see how she would be like well i can ride that far you know i don't have to be a man and and i completely understand that i mean let's put it this way in this race of the 80, 90-ish people that have ever tried, the females have a lot higher finish percentage rate because those two gals finished, and that's it. Dang right. They, are, they, they can eat my lunch, and they can eat most, most of you guys' <laughs> lunch out there. And But Absolutely. I, I think you know people that are serious riders and such, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. This race, it does not matter. You know, uh, it certainly doesn't matter what your gender is, but it, it doesn't matter um, – anything other than like your skill set like can you just suffer if you can suffer you're good to go like you are super good to go if you can suffer um so we're yeah, not gonna I think change that's the a name key aspect i mean most of it i think revolves maybe around the tasks and stuff because i think initially like we would say stuff like pee out a campfire you know and all this kind of stuff we never had that kind of stuff going on but we like in, we just about that kind of stuff like you may have to do falconry when you're out there or you know whittle a bar of soap like you thinking of the tasks that somebody can do in like 30 seconds to a minute or so, because you do not want the tasks to be why somebody doesn't complete the race. Like you don't want that to be it. You want it to be all on them. Right. Uh, you know, if you rolled into some place and was like, all right, there's a bunch of uh, pool balls on a pool table and all you gotta do is rack them up. Like how long does it take 30 seconds to rack them? Right. And then you can just get your QR code and go, uh, you know, but, counter that with you have to like catch a fish that could be you know days days, <laughs> days out there right but you know or exactly. fell a tree but if we said you had to fillet a fish like just quickly like do some cutting on a fish it's just you know it's that like we have you know, played around with some of that stuff obviously if we had you perform an oil change or whatever it'd be crazy but la- uh, last year you know uh, you know you went to this spot. It was actually the same spot where there was pole dancing. And it was the same spot where you had to pose with a puppy. So one year we had to, um, had everybody go with these puppies and they were all adopted within a week. So some of the tasks, you know, I mean, the man thing is we're all humans. Like it's, it's just part of the, the cool, 
you know, what are you, what's going to happen next type of thing that happens here. But uh, same place, different time of uh, on the actual race went through and they had to like, there was just a little station with candles in this tent on the edge of the woods. And they had to express their feet later, right? And express their feelings at that particular moment. Right. <laughs> and then they were, they were told those that were left to post those up to Instagram and stuff. So I got some, <laughs> I got some mixed emotions at, at 4 a.m. <laughs> from some different people. So it's kind of interesting. But, uh, yeah, I think I think the tasks that are out there, uh, the human tasks that are out there are, are really where maybe people thought the identity of that uh, man thing was in there because it's like you've been the first one to, like, pee out a – somebody just said, it, like – so we got like pee out a campfire and like yeah no, that we've never asked anybody to do any of that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But we also haven't asked them to go bowling or lock picking or show us a magic trick. Well, we did sort of something like we've that. done a magic trick yeah. and a joke and yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, but you've thrown darts and we haven't asked you to skin a you know <laughs> skin an animal or roadkill or anything like that. Or uh, yeah. we have had the we, best one. So we have had people get you know do a chain grease tattoo, but we haven't actually asked you to get a henna tattoo or a real tattoo out there. So um, yeah, that's intense. Yeah, so it's just just fun things, and we haven't had anybody. Speaking of intense, we haven't had anybody had to set up a tent and then get in the tent. That, Ooh, there that's you intense. Go. But we have had a <laughs> we have had a tent out there in the middle of the night uh, at a spot where if you did want to drop out. People were willing to let you just sleep in their tent, and you know, and they would take care of you and all that kind of stuff. So, with the gypsies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think the best one that I've ever gotten to do was the puppies. Just the picture with puppies. They were yeah, it's adorable, cool. like, and it's four week old or three yeah. week old puppies or whatever. It was awesome. Yeah, the and, and one of the writers, Brandy from the Brandy Rule, she there was one she fell in love with. She was she was going to adopt. She told the girl she was going to adopt it. But because of the social media that you guys all pushed out for that, they were all claimed by the end of that day, and it was wow. They're yeah. They by the time she got done with the race, recontacted said, "I'll be back on Monday." The dog was already claimed. Like all those puppies were claimed. And, oh, so wow, that's awesome. And that was just a time. And this race thing. does good. Yep. Yeah. So it's not just an adventure race. It also does something for the community, which is fantastic. Yes. Keeps you guys out off the streets for 30 hours. <laughs> exactly. <Just joking. laughs> and so I know that it sounds like you might be walking away from Enduro here in the near future. But so with making Manduro, I know we've had some people from out of state, like up in New York and all that, but is there a sense of like wanting to keep it grassroots or get it as wide known as possible? Oh, that's, I mean, that's an easy question. I've always wanted to keep it grassroots. Um, okay. Uh, even if it, I mean, I think it is, it has become more wide known. That doesn't mean they're going to come and do it because it just doesn't, like, you have to kind of, you know, you're when you're signing up for a race, you're just looking at a screen most of the time if you haven't experienced it and if you don't live there and you're kind of trusting what you read uh, on their website or, you know, other people promote and that kind of stuff and and uh, i've never had a big huge marketing machine behind this nor will we ever and so um you know and from the get-go you know we just realized you know how many you know talking to my volunteers saying like how many people could we manage you know and and like 50 is top end and it, it's hard to manage even 30 of you guys sometimes um in any of the races but so when you, you could, especially this year we have the races combined um, you know, I set the cap at 50. So if we, when we hit 50, both races combined, it's done. And they're, you sign up for one, you sign up for both. So, uh, but this year, you know, I'm going to give a lot more, um, it's 150 bucks, but I mean, all the money goes right back into the race. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I don't necessarily, I'm not saying I'm going to be done this year or next year or the year after, but if I start running out of ideas, or if somebody wants to take it under their umbrella that does have a huge marketing machine behind it, it would be sad to see my baby go the route of, Absolutely. of you just have anybody can be in it, you know, and tons of people, and it just turns into something like that. It would just be a different thing. But um, 
And so I think for Mandara to lose that character, I mean, it'd be okay. I mean, I, I would be okay with it if I ever let it go. But I can tell you right now, I still got a lot of things that we haven't done yet. We did the Clover Leaf in 2020. That wrecked some people and helped some people, but you know, uh, prevented some people from getting home. But yeah, no, it's worth the, it. The, the Clover, the Clover <laughs> Leaf. So we had never done. You know, you came back through downtown to the roughly the same general like two blocks three times, and then on the fourth time it was the finish line, and you know. Not all of them are designed the same, but on that particular clover leaf, the guy that was leading it, like he's a, <laughs> I look at his record in other races, so I'm like, dude, that dude is, he's awesome. <laughs> yeah. He got there and it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, last call place. It wasn't the, um, you, you wouldn't, you weren't going to be like pulled from the race if you didn't make it that far, but his car was sitting a block away. And he could see it. He's like, eh. he's 90 miles into Mandara. And he's still good. He's like, yeah, I told my kids I'd make it to this. But my car's right there. So I'm out. <laughs> tapping out. So he tapped out. I'm telling you, that's that Navy SEAL bell. I mean, as soon as you get people within a close proximity of being able to quit, a lot of people bet jump ship. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't want them to. I especially don't want really good riders to. Um, that, that year, you know, we had... I, Rented a campsite. I had volunteers that were camping out all night out of the campsite. Um, you had to get there by one a.m. It was the man, it was the COVID year, um, and then they were given specific instructions at one a.m. Burn the QR code. There was one QR code that was in existence. They had it out there. They had a fire going a campfire at one a.m. They burned it. Uh, you know, everybody that got through before then, they got through. So this year, because they're both races are going at the same time. The 60 mile mark, there is not going to be a uh, last call challenge unless you consider the 60 mile mark where Mindoro is the last call challenge. Um, it's going to be set up in a way that, you know, if you wanted to keep trying to go, whether there are uh, chain gang volunteers there or not, there'll be a QR code chain that you can continue go riding as long as you want. Uh, still, 30, you got to be done in 30, um, 30 hours, and uh, <laughs> we got some stuff planned for you. We got some interesting. <laughs> That's I, awesome. I have some ghost sponsors that don't want to be known until like just before the race, during the race, after the race. Uh, there's there's some different stuff going to happen this year than ever, and just expect the unexpected. So if you've ever ridden it before, I mean just you're not going to be able to, you're not even going to be able to guess any part of this. If you've never read it. That's interesting because that's what like being a previous participant in Manduro. My explanation of Manduro is that it's a adventure bike race, but if you think it's going to be a certain way, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, uh, that, we should probably have that be like one of the bylines on it. Like, if you think it's going to be a certain <laughs> way, it's not. It is a grueling bicycle adventure. Uh, the grueling part is all, you know, I guess up to you how you feel about that. Uh, but you can overtrain for it. You can undertrain for it. You can just go in and just be like, nah, I'm just going to ride and hurt. Um, I think the best thing to do is just come in with an open mind and just have some fun. And, and then that way, if you do find yourself being more successful and then getting to a next place and then you find yourself at 3 a.m. out there um, singing karaoke to a bunch of uh, uh, beaver dams in the middle of like uh, <laughs> you know, a lake somewhere, I mean, and you're all right. Okay, you're like, I'm just going to keep on going. I wonder what's going to happen at 4, 5, and 6 a.m. What, 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 what wonder how I'm going to feel at 11 a.m. tomorrow. If I'm riding at 11 a.m. tomorrow, I'm within, like, you know, I'm within smelling the barn of finishing this thing. I got to keep pedaling at that point, right? You know, and then if you got to, like, roll into, like, some, you know, uh, summer uh, pop-up craft fair and haggle for, you know, as one of your tasks, haggle for, you know, a piece of art, then, all right, then you, you, you'd be willing to do that at, you know, 11 or 12 before you right in like you're just looking for those boxes you know there's only 13 of them out there but 
You could hit 13 exactly. and still have another 100 miles to go, right? <laughs> it could be yeah. it could be designed like that. You could be it could be designed where you hit all the boxes and you're like you look down at your your mileage and you say crap, this must be a 250 mile race. And I've already gotten all the boxes and there's still another 100 miles to go on my account. Like you could you, all that kind of stuff messes with your head a little bit, but in a good way. It messes with your head in a good way. Yeah, it definitely turns into you versus you. Because I know, like, in 2020, because I got eliminated, like, probably within the first six hours of the race or something like that. But then the next day, I actually went to one of the stops to hang out and see the participants come through. And they were, like, 210 miles in. And we're like, oh, yeah, just another 60 miles. And they're like, oh, 60 more miles like that is... That's brutal. Forty at that point. If they were two ten in on their calculations, then maybe they were over at that point. But I never. Oh, then maybe we were just psyching them out for no reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's never like the the route you should take is never over two fifty ever. And most of the time, gotcha. on the big race, the route. So I mentioned that on Menduro, they usually the route you should take is between fifty five and fifty eight. Um, depending on whether you take a road or a greenway or, or you hike a bike or whatnot, or whether you had your bike with you or backtrack. But on Mandaro, I usually make it about 2.30. However, like even when I try to plan it for 2.30, there are still guys that rode 2.60, 2.62, whatever. Yeah, definitely. But most of the people in the last last year, I think everybody came in, like they were like, wow, I can't believe it. I'm like right at like 2.46 or, two, you know, right in that, that zone. And I'm like, wow. And I watched them out there so that means in some some places i saw them take a route that i didn't know and in some cases i saw them like going back and forth back and forth looking for something out in the woods and at like 3 a.m and you're like just you know you're like yelling at the screen just go over there's a path just go over there just like, you want them to find it but they just come in from the wrong ain't wrong side so some of it's by design some of it's by some of it's by just I know people are going to just overthink it. And winter Mendero. And sometimes, too, it just stuff blends in. I mean, it's in the woods, and in the heat of the moment, you're like, you see the thing. It's like, okay, there's a sign that lets me know that the QR code is around here. Right. But then everything looks like bark, and then it's impossible to find. That's a, a good point that you said. So for all you guys that are listening, so we use a different color of um, lane tape now. And so this is one of those things that has evolved. And so, you know, when you go out in the woods, any, anytime you go out, you can be riding on a greenway or just in your, heck, you can be riding around your neighborhood. You see where people have tied off orange or pink, you know, marking tape on trees. It's everywhere, right? So in general, I will use a different color every year. And that color, that tape is for you to visually know when you're close that you're at a spot. And it's generally, I mean, it's always, there's no other color like that around. So you're, and it's the same color throughout every race. Um, I have a, this corporate QR code account, so I can actually see how many people have ever scanned it and all these things. And in fact, I could probably, any ones that are still out there on a tree somewhere, I could go in and reprogram if I really wanted to. And I'm thinking about doing a race <laughs> where I just do a reprogram race and I just reprogram ones that are already out there and they point to other ones. And see if it works. Oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> so I want to do that maybe when you're not as part of this race, but maybe like for some veterans and stuff, like not, not charge anybody anything. There's a random treasure hunt right there. Yeah, just go out and just reprogram <laughs> the, the things from within the, the app that I have. <laughs> it's funny because I name every one of them. And that's not just for me. It's also for you, the racers. I name them all. And some of them are named according to what you know, like the area they're at or like just to give them a fun name or whatever but a lot of times it gives you a hint at w you know, where you're going and such so you're at a tree that says it has a QR code and has the name of the other ones but nobody ever takes you don't have time they don't take time to read that name and some people are like oh I went there and I'm looking around I couldn't decide and I'm like well, did you not read the name of the last one like it's like <laughs> It's like called it's called going to rehab. There's the rehab center is like right there. It's the tree right next to the rehab center. Like, like yeah. <laughs> so like, oh, I didn't even think to do that. 
So, you know. I'll... And that's another bit of advice, too, yeah. for every future writer. Just read the Just thing. be observant yeah. and just think. <laughs> think through things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, this year I think is going to be really, really special. Um, I mean, I say that every year, and I try to ma- I do try to live up to that every year. And so, and it isn't about like trying to outdo the previous year or do, it's about like giving a different adventure. So I have to plan for somebody that's done it every year as just as much as I have to plan for somebody that's never done it for the super, super athlete, just as much as somebody that's just like, I'm just going to give it a go. And it has to be a great experience for both ends of those spectrums. Right. And, you know, I constantly think through that and I constantly plan that out in the programming. And so um, that's, that's where I'm at. I mean, I think if you just go out and ride as long as you want, you're going to get a, a, a good experience. I've got a guy that does the Mindoro race. He signs up every time he comes out. I, I don't know if he's ever made it like three or four to the third or fourth, like checkpoint ever, you know, he just goes out and goes does some something. I'll see his dot. Like, like, where is he? And I'll look and it'll be, in some other part of the area, <laughs> just he's just exploring. Just likes to be a part of it, which is super cool. And I mean, in some ways, it like makes me crazy because like I, I still worry about him, and just like I worry about somebody like crashing or like something weird happening out there. But if you go to Mandero dot rocks, go the first thing you should do before you read any of the other stuff is just go to the warning and read it because. I mean, anything can happen out there. This is not, we jest about some of this stuff, but it is still a very serious endeavor. And you, uh, you know, you could get divorced because you ride this thing. You could, (laughs) you could, you know, you could die out on this thing. And um, I don't want any of those things to happen. It's the prime of the summer. The biggest thing that's going to doesn't stop yeah, because the you're thing, doing the thing that's going to get you more than the heat are the mosquitoes, probably. Um, but I mean, it could be hurricaning at that time. God, it's it's crazy. It could be any kind of weather, and we would certainly only call it off if you couldn't progress because of lightning and all those kind of things. And and then maybe I don't. I mean, I don't know how we would ever like just hold it at a different time. Maybe we just credit you for. And I would just do like a pop up one at some other time, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'd be cool yeah, well, you, with your old QR codes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a trip um, down memory lane, Manduro. Yeah, this year I think for your so this year I've already got so the winner of each race. I did this for the winter Manduro um, two years ago. So there's these bricks. So the winner is going to get something, but it's already embedded in a brick, and you're going to break it with a sledgehammer at the end and there's these really nice like knives some of and but you don't know like the company that put that embedded whatever it is in the brick like they decided and they it, it could be like this super high-end knife none of them are cheap knives but it could be like a super high-end knife or a super high-end multi-tool or something like that so it's gonna be interesting well that's cool i hate that i moved all the way out to washington because now i really want to i want to do it i've been wanting to finish one ever since it started and I heard about it. So once I get back to North Carolina, we're definitely going to go and give it another go. What was your motivation for signing up the first time you ever did? So I really like the aspect of ultra endurance, um, like inspiration from like Lil Wilcox and just random people in the cycling community that do ultra distance. That's just, I like getting out there and just pushing myself to the limit, just gut wrenching, suffer fest i love pushing myself to see how much i can take Mm -hmm. obviously i can't take that much if i haven't only made it but like eight to ten hours into manduro but it's like you have so many different aspects of riding that come into play it's the ultra endurance and long distance it's the fuel it's the scavenger hunt aspect of it and i mean honestly like i think any story that and any type of riding and anything in life if it sucks and it's difficult, it's way more memorable than when anything went your way. Yeah. So I really like that aspect of, holy cow, you'll never believe what I did. <laughs> I rode 260 miles for what? For a good story, a scavenger hunt. Yeah, 250. For a good time, a good story, and for Strava. So I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> 
Here we go. Back so to yeah, the Dragon Arms Stra- the Strava thing. It's interesting. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. And just for the record, it is not a scavenger hunt. You don't have to hunt for anything. You just go to where the QR code take toes. So maybe in the first year, but um, it's not. It's definitely not a scavenger hunt or a uh, what do they call geo cash or anything. It's not none of that stuff. Oh it's yeah, just, the geocaching. It's just yeah. an interaction with the QR code and the latitude and longitude. It's just an interaction with the Google Maps so that you can get to the next spot so that we don't have to show you the route ahead of time so that it becomes uh, you know this adventure that reveals itself. Like if you already know, and then you're just like, oh, I didn't make it over to that part of town or whatever, then it's a little bit different than like, where did it go? It, it went out on this peninsula at a lake, and you had to cross with a ferry. I, what? I didn't know that. So, you know, and I have and That's a, what's so cool about like, after watching everyone do it, and then the people that finished, and it's on Strava, and you can go and see the route and see exactly where they went, and it's like, that's insane. Mm-hmm. And then you see all the elevation gained over the course of the whole race and everything. And it's like, that's a serious ride. Yeah. And I mean, most of those rides, like when people get eliminated, it's a serious ride anyway. Yeah. But once you get to overnight or even from sun up to sundown, that's serious. And when you get to like 10,000 plus feet climbing in a ride, that's just madness. Mm. So it's just, all those different types of things come into play with Manduro, and it's just, it makes the whole package of stupid, like you, <laughs> you have gotta, daddy issues you gotta, if you do this and finish. You gotta be an idiot to, to sign up for this. But yeah. <laughs> just be an idiot to do something that I, I mean, that you're all pretty capable of, but it all matters what kind of vehicle you're gonna get on, right? You're gonna get on a, you know, a 29er, you're gonna ride, try, just try to ride a mountain bike, you're gonna try to like risk it with a road bike, don't ride a road bike yeah don't do don't use a road bike gravel bike and gravel bike and chain out the fork just in case you want the you know some suspension going on i I don't know like there is no setup and i didn't think about that and nor have i ever ever once looked at any of the strava stuff i've never looked at strava i've never looked at strava from any what anybody's ever completed i don't know what anybody's stuff looks like and to be quite honest i don't care like you have to ride this ride. It's for the adventure. I mean, your bragging rights are in those other little corridors that you have in life, and and I get that. I don't design it the, the race for that kind of thing. This year's race, I've designed to like just blow everybody's mind. It's going to be interesting. Oh man! I mean, it's going to. Can't wait to hear about psychologically, it. Psychologically, I mean, I know how. <laughs> I know. I mean. I, I've had a you know a few years of seeing how people psychologically and get feedback how they take it. Psychologically, I think this is going to mess around with, for sure, locals. So if you're not a local, it won't matter. You'll just come ride this, and you're going to ride sixty or two fifty. You're all right. If you're a local, it's just going to mess with your head. You're just going to be like, I thought. Will I, they need therapy after it? I thought I know everything. Uh, Massage, <laughs> massage therapy for sure. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> maybe a massage therapy for sure. Uh, maybe some dry needling, but uh, you're gonna be. Um, I mean, the biggest thing you might have to worry about is, you know, don't like no direction takes you across. We haven't covered this yet. None of the routes from the point you're at to the next point take you across private property or any place that says do not enter. But the way I've calculated the mileage includes a place that doesn't say do not enter, no trespassing or any of that kind of stuff. So if you you make a decision to go a certain way to a uh, um, to the next QR code or checkpoint and you come across one of those things, and you're not going the way I calculated it, for sure. I mean, so that's another good point, too. So if you're going to do Manduro... Look out for the no trespassing, do not enters. That's not how it's designed. Mm -mm. Because I've come up to those signs and be like, okay, well, now I have to rethink about how I'm going to get there. And then that's when you pull up Google Maps again and you start zooming in and be like, okay, where am I heading to and how do I get around this? Because that kind of acts as like a roadblock. Yes. The best thing you could do at that moment, like anytime you get to some place where you're like, I don't think this is the way that 
it was calculated. Like, think about that. How did he calculate this into the total distance for this particular route? As soon as you get to a place and like, I don't think this is the way, the first thing you should do is not even think about it. Just turn around and start riding as fast as you can back. So you don't have to go all the way back to where you were before, but just get out of there as fast as you can. Don't try to like see if you can out trick yourself. I know where their temptations are, and you know I, I know where. Sometimes there's a spot where, and, and like I don't plan any any spots where uh, you use the same like formula for each one. But I'll see them, and I'm like, all right, if I put it here, they they just. Somebody's gonna go over here and do this. I know somebody's gonna go over here and do this. And if they're in the lead, if they're in front of like some other people, they're gonna the other people are gonna follow them. Oh but, yeah. But sometimes I'll think like, why? I'll be looking at everybody in real time, like, why are you going that way? What is the? There was nothing about it that said go that way. Like it was, it was clearly a great road right over there, or a greenway, or something you could have been on, and came in and came in from above. That's the way I would have done it. Like. So, and what I also that's another good element too of Manduro. It's like being a participant. It's like you see people going this way, but your GPS might say go this way, and you're like, there's a hesitation in your mind of like, oh, do I? I see the leaders right there, and they're going this way, but this says go this way, and it's like, oh, that split second decision can just completely ruin your race. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or or make your race. Or make your race, yeah. yeah. I mean, or make your race just because the group is going there, and that uh, I think you rode with the group that uh, up near, um, if I remember correctly, I, th- I think it was on on a Menduro. I saw all these bikes laid out on Buffalo Road in a picture, and I'm thinking, and then I saw all the dots. Well, I in real time, the picture after that, all the dots in the thing, right? And if you'd just come down the Greenway. And not thought to pop up on Buffalo Road or not been following somebody else, you would have seen where it cuts off of the new screenway and you would have ridden right yeah. up and you would have seen from the path you're on the stuff tied on to the tree. Because that's the way that I plan that I was thinking that it would go. You're gonna come up, you're gonna, it's gonna be off road, it's gonna be this trail, you're gonna be like, I didn't know this was here, but a bunch of people went up on Buffalo Road and they just laid their bikes on the ground and they bushwhacked through. But if you're bushwhacking through a bunch of terrain to get to a dot, you could come out 15 yards away and never see it. And then I saw everybody's dots and then a, another rider came from the right direction, came up, had it, didn't tell anybody and was gone. Like, was there with everybody because you, but you, you're, there's so many people there you think, oh, we're all working together to find this. Well, that person was only like working to like win the race. <laughs> so they blended in perfectly with you guys, got the QR code, and just went back and got on their bike and took off while everybody else. If was- I'm not mistaken, I think that when he left, I was like, hey, you have the QR code. You found it. We've been looking here for a long time. Will you tell me where it is? <laughs> oh, and yeah. he was like, yeah, I had to run him down and be like, where's the QR code? And he was like, wait, wait, here. And then I, and then he just took off. And I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, hey, guys, I found it. Because <laughs> there was guys out in the swamp, like, up to their waist. There were people out, and like, thinking that I was trying to fool them, but I wasn't. And just realized that, like, you, when you start getting out in those areas, now the tree cover, screwing with your GPS and all that kind of stuff. And really, like, I came in in no tree cover, in the only areas there were no tree cover and that's where I placed it and all that kind of stuff. So, and I, I remember that particular spot, that particular spot made me like use multiple devices to triangulate afterwards so that I had the, ex- like as close as I could to the exact same deal when I programmed it into the QR code so that it wasn't because I think everybody got out there and it was bouncing around and it was moving around and the way I'm like, okay, I have to account for that in future races or in future you know, spots just because I want you to find it. I don't want you to be out here like ro- roaming around in the woods. Like even if you come in from a different angle, I don't want you to be roaming around in the woods like trying to find this thing. I want you to be able to walk right up to it, scan it, and then have to go 
hike all the way back to the woods to where you left your bikes a quarter of a mile away. Yeah, which is what we did. Because, yeah. I mean, at at the peak time on that one, I think there was probably like 15 guys out there looking for this QR code, and no one could find it. And then the one guy who did fa- find it, he walked all the way around the lake, I think, or the pond or whatever it was. He walked all the way around it, somehow stumbled upon it, and I was like, wait, that guy's grabbing his bike. I need to follow him. Mm. And then, yeah, I ran him down and was able to get it. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Good old times out there. That was the first Mendura, I think. Yeah, exactly. Because we ended up at Pine State afterwards. Yep. Well, yeah, so for all you listeners out there, if you're interested in attempting Mandura or Manduros, make sure to check out Manduro.rocks. And it's like .com, but .rocks. So make sure to check it out or just do a Google search for Manduro. And so thank you, Domino, for being on the podcast. Personally, I've learned so much about you as a person and your adventure, but also just about the conceptual conceptualization, yeah, if that's, that's the word, that's the word of, think. yeah, of Manduro. So thank you for being on the podcast and I can't wait to have you on again. I appreciate you having me. Thank you guys. And I hope I see you guys at that starting line. Get in before Absolutely. they're all Absolutely. So go check it out. Yeah. <laughs>